Good evening. Welcome to the video. I'm glad you're here today, and if you like what I'm doing, please like and subscribe. It would help a lot. I'm not gonna spend long on that. Panther Tank officially designated the Panzer Kampfwagen 5 Panther emerged during one of the most intense periods of World War II. By 1941, as Germany launched Operation Barbarossa and was pushed deep into Soviet territory, their tanks faced unexpected adversaries. The Soviet T-34 was new, and its revolutionary sloped armor made it incredibly resilient, while its wide tracks allowed it to navigate mud and snow of the Eastern Front with ease. The 76.2mm gun proved devastating to the lighter Panzer III's and Panzer IV's, forcing Germany to scramble for an answer. The Panther was conceived as a direct response to this challenge. Germany needed a tank that could rival the T-34, not just in firepower, but also in protection, mobility, and overall battlefield adaptability. This marked the beginning of a tank development process that would bring together the best of German engineering and innovation, though not without significant challenges and controversies. To note, this would also be the time that the Tiger I was in development and would start to be fielded by later Operation Barbarossa. To design this new tank, Germany turned to the two leading engineering firms, Daimler-Benz and Mann. Each company was tasked with creating a prototype, which would be evaluated in a head-to-head -head competition. The Daimler-Benz design, known as the VK-3001DB, took heavy inspiration from the T-34 itself. The turret was positioned further forward and giving it the tank an aggressive, compact profile, but at the cost of internal space. The Daimler-Benz suspension system relied on overlapping leaf spring suspension, which were simpler to manufacture, but less durable in rugged or muddy terrain. The design also featured a unique element, like a driver's hatch that could potentially fall forward to let the driver out. Not to mention, the turret ring itself was 50 millimeters shorter than what was standardized for the MAN version. Rheinmetall made the turret, which is seen on the Panther, and Daimler-Benz decided to make their own. The turret was smaller, the turret ring was smaller, and it made it harder for crew to work efficiently. Not to mention, with the flat-faced turret being so close to the front of the tank, if rounds were to hit and ricochet off the front plate, it would more than likely damage the gun, or even damage the front plate of the turret. Worse yet, the huge reason this wasn't chosen was because there was fear that with the gun being so far forward if they were to go down any hills or into mud down a hill the gun would dig into the terrain that was a no-go now i'd said before the competing design the vk3002 man borrowed the t34 sloped armor concept but adapted it to fit german production standards its torsion bar suspension provided a smoother ride and greater reliability, particularly over uneven ground. The turret, larger and more sentry placed, improved balance and greater crew ergonomics, making the MAN design a more practical solution for Germany's needs. After extensive trials, the MAN prototype was selected becoming the basis for what would become the Panther D. The MAN prototype was finalized as the Panther Offs D, the first production model of the Panther series. It was equipped with a powerful 7.5cm KWK-42L70 gun, a high-velocity weapon capable of piercing the armor of most Allied tanks at long range. Its sloped armor up to 80 millimeters thick gave it ex excellent protection against oncoming fire. Its Maidbach HL230 P30 engine provided an impressive 700 horsepower. Despite these strengths, the Panther D was plagued with issues. Its 7-speed gearbox frequently broke down, and the engine was prone to overheating and even catching on fire. 
these problems were so severe that many Panthers broke down before they even reached the battlefield. The Panther D made its combat debut during the Battle of Kursk in July of 1943. This massive engagement was the largest in tank battle history, and the Panther's performance was closely watched. While its gun and armor performed admirably, the mechanical failures prevented it from achieving the decisive impact Germany was hoping for. Despite these setbacks, the Panther D laid the foundation for what would become one of the most respected tanks of the war. Once its initial issues were addressed, the Panther became a cornerstone of German armored forces. It was deployed alongside Panzer IVs and Panzer III's, as well as the formidable Tiger I, often leading assaults against Soviet and Allied positions. The Panther's gun allowed it to engage enemies at long distances, where its accuracy and penetration power gave it a clear advantage. Its sloped armor proved far more effective than the flat, boxy designs of earlier German tanks like the Panzer IV and especially the Tiger, allowing it to deflect oncoming shells a lot better. However, the Panther was not without its own flaws. Its weight made it less effective in muddy or snowy terrain, and its complex systems required frequent maintenance. As mentioned before, the 7-speed gearbox would break down, the engine on the earlier Panther would potentially even catch fire due to overheating issues. On the battlefield, these issues often left units with fewer operational Panthers than planned, a critical disadvantage during prolonged engagements. The Panther Alfs A was introduced to address the shortcomings of the D model. Its engine cooling system was redesigned to reduce overheating, a new commander's cupola was added, giving tank commanders much better visibility and protection. The most noticeable changes was the introduction of a ball-mounted hull machine gun, which replaced the Panther D's vulnerable fixed machine gun port. While these upgrades improved the Panther's overall effectiveness, it still struggled with reliability and suffered from design flaw known as the shot trap. The gun's mantlet shape could cause incoming shells to ricochet into the tank's roof, a vulnerability that enemy forces quickly tried to exploit. There was only a few known incidences where this actually happened. Despite these issues, the Panther A proved highly effective on both the eastern and western fronts. It frequently clashed with the Soviet tanks like the KV series and the oncoming IS series, and even the American Shermans like the M4s and the M476s, as well as the tanks designed to kill the Tiger, the Sherman Firefly, often excelling in open terrains where its gun and armor could shine against these tanks as well. Editing Django here, I just realized something. I hadn't even talked about the Dula Cologne. Now, the Dula Cologne is very important to the Panther's history, as it was the first time the Panthers had ever encountered the M26 Pershing. The Dula Cologne was a very interesting point in a tank battle, as the M26 was very new to the battlefield. The Panther A crew, having been against two Shermans right before this, saw the M26 come around the corner and hadn't even thought of what tank it might be. The crew did report they thought it was another Panther, but only to figure out it would fire at the Panther, setting the ammunition ablaze. In the footage you might be seeing on screen, you can see that the crew does survive, at least the majority of them. The Panther was left to rot. They moved its gun at some point later, more than likely to not freak out tank crews who might be coming down the roads. Also to note, a poor couple who might have seen the oncoming Germans with their Panzers, such as the Panther and Panzer IVs, more than likely saw the other Americans too, or heard the Americans coming through firefighting or anything that was happening. They got in their vehicle and fled the scene. During the retreat from Cologne, they got fired upon by a Panzer IV bow gunner. Now most reports you might see people talk about the Pershing gunner also firing at them with his machine gun instead of the 90 mil. Most people will talk about that, forgetting that the Germans also shot at this car. Neither side understood that it might be French civilians. And even if they did, 
the Germans wouldn't have really given a crap about it. They were there to kill, destroy, and take. That was what the Germans were doing. The Shermans and the Persian crew and infantry seeing this car would have more than likely thought it was Germans trying to flee or maybe set up an ambush point. So the blame is not to be put on anybody except maybe the Germans who more than likely killed the couple as the couple's car was found about a block away off of a corner crashed with the couple dead inside. It is unknown who got the kill. It is likely thought that both contributed to the death of this couple. The Panther Off's G represented the pinnacle of the Panther's design. One of the most critical improvements was the redesign of the gun mantlet to eliminate the shot trap, significantly enhancing the survivability of the tank and crew. The side armor was also thickened, providing a better protection against flanking attacks and anti-tank weaponry. Additionally, manufacturing processes were streamlined to increase production without compromising quality. The Panther G became the most widely produced variant, serving in nearly every major theater the Panthers were to serve in. Something to note with this, the Panther G was the pinnacle because it added in what helped stop the shot trap. It was a 15 degree piece of metal that all they had to do was weld to the turret mantlet. This helped with production because they could take earlier Panther D and Panther A turrets, add this strip of armor, and put it on a tank hole, and it would be ready for war. Which is why the Panther G is so prevalent in a lot of the theaters Germany had to face in. Mainly even the Western Front, where a lot of the Panthers did serve. As Germany faced mounting pressures on all fronts, it sought to improve the Panther even further. The Panther Alfs F featured a new turret design, the Schmaltturm, which was more compact and heavily armored. Advanced optics, including a stereoscopic rangefinder, were added to improve accuracy. However, only a handful of Panther Fs were completed before the war's end. The Schmaltturm turret itself was designed as a way to mass produce tanks. As this was getting to the point, Germany was suffering from a shortage in materials. So, unlike what they had done before, they were trying to finally start putting together a mass producible tank. While the Panther series was not fully mass producible, the small term turret would have been. And also f coming off of the small term, the Panther II was an ambitious attempt to create a heavily armored successor to the Panther series. It shared a lot of components with the Tiger II, such as its suspension and a lot of the design choices, including thicker frontal armor and a reinforced suspension system. However, the Panther II was never really completed with only one hole built. This hole was fitted with a Panther G turret, and it remains mostly a fascinating what if in tank history. The Panther II, as I'd said, sought to become the best version, and I have talked about a bit of what these were in a couple other videos, but the Panther II was a stepping stone to what would become the standard Panzer, which interestingly enough was supposed to basically turn the Panther series and the Tiger II series into one tank that could share almost every component and be easier to produce. This never really happened though, as the Panther II only had a few components that the Tiger II did have. It was supposed to share engines, it was supposed to share suspension, and even take design elements, but it never really got past that, as I had said. Only one hole was completed and fitted with a Panther G turret. Thankfully, the Panther II survived, captured by the American, of which it survives today in its original condition. Not likely to be drivable ever again, but you can see this Panther II in museums. It has moved around a lot. I think the last time I saw it anywhere on the internet was the Patton Museum in Kentucky, which is also where the last surviving small term turret exists from a Panther F. Sadly, it was used for target practice after World War II, so it is the only living and surviving example even with the amount of damage that it does have. There are also a lot of Panther variants, 
that utilizes the panther chassis for numerous specialized role. The Burger Panther was served as a recovery vehicle equipped with winches and cranes to tow damaged vehicles or just those who were broke down. This is not too uncommon as using tank bodies to recover other tanks is normal. We do it today, we've always done it. The Yagd Panther, a tank destroyer armed with the devastating 88mm Pac-43, became one of the most effective anti-tank weapons of the war. And that is one that I really want to make a separate video on and why I haven't talked too much about it in this video. It is such an interesting variant of the Panther, not my favorite, but definitely worthy of its own video, including this one, the Experimental Flak Panther, designed for anti-aircraft use, and the command-focused Panzerbefehlswagen Panther, demonstrating the Panther's versatility for any use, especially with command roles. Like I also said, the Flak Panther is one I want to make the video on as well, because the Flak Panther didn't really go anywhere. It is an interesting design and an interesting proof of concept that almost made it to production. Today, the Panther is remembered as a symbol of German engineering. Surviving examples can be seen around the world, including the Bovington Tank Museum in the UK, the Kubinka Museum in Russia, and even some within France and again, the US. Not to mention, France and Poland both also have captured panthers that have very unique history. Panther Dolphine, one used by the French resistance, is still around to this day. Poland also have their own captured panthers that were used during the Poland Uprising. The panther has also captured the imagination of enthusiasts and historians, appearing in films like T-34 and video games like World of Tanks and War Thunder. In countless books and documentaries. Its blend of innovation and flaws makes it a fascinating subject for anyone interested in military history. I thank you for listening. If you have come this far, please like and subscribe, share the video, it would help a lot. I am trying my best to continue doing what I'm doing, even though I'm not seeing much growth right now, I'm still trying my hardest. Thank you so much. Goodbye.